Hello, my name is Sierra and welcome to my channel, Homemade Mathematics. Today's video is going to show you 10 activities you can do on the first day, first week, or really any time that will have your students engaged and having fun. On the first day of school, I usually only start with an icebreaker activity, which I actually did create a video on, so if you are looking for some icebreaker ideas, go ahead and check that out. After we finish the icebreaker, I like to do some type of fun, engaging activity. Whether that's working on team building, working on problem solving skills, or even some of them are math related. So like I said, these would all be great activities to throw in after your icebreaker on the first day, or even like throughout the week when you're going over your syllabus and classroom expectations. It's always nice to kind of throw in a game there at the end um, to make the day a little more exciting. Some of these games even help with your class expectations. If you want to see that one, go ahead and skip to number two. Which, by the way, all the timestamps are in the description box below if you want to skip around. All of these games I've either come up with myself, seen another teacher use, stole from another teacher and then I used and put my own spin on it, or something I've seen on the internet and heard other teachers use. All of these activities are super adjustable for any skill level, um, so you can make little tweaks to help them fit your classroom, as well as flexibility with how you play the game and how your classroom is set up. I know we're all coming from different classroom setups, so I really tried to come up with various versions of each of these, so you could do them in classroom or virtually through a Zoom meeting or something like that. All of these games would be great for the first day or first week, but you can really play them any time of year. It's always nice to have a little game in the back of your mind in case you finish five or ten minutes early and you don't want them just sitting around, you can pull out one of these games. All right, let's go ahead and get into it with our first activity. Our first activity is going to be challenging students with what I like to call algebra puzzles. If you don't know what I'm talking about, this is what they look like. Right, you could do this in person by projecting them on the screen and then having students work independently at their desk um, with whiteboards or on a piece of paper. You could have them um, do it with a partner, with a group. You could set up stations, however you want to do that. But this is also great for doing virtually because you could just project one of these onto your screen and then have all students work through them. You could even turn it into a Kahoot. I would just make sure you give maximum amount of time because some of these are tricky. There are so many different algebra puzzles out there. They have the simplest ones to extremely hard ones. So you can really find one that's going to fit any student's skill level. How I find these is either looking up on Facebook, Pinterest, or Google, um, and I type in like algebra puzzles or algebra picture puzzles, and then usually I'm flooded with them. I also actually have a video that goes through a few of these algebra puzzles if you want to check that out. The most important thing with this activity is hearing the students' reasoning. So have students be able to talk you through, well I found apples were two, so then down here I plugged in two for apples and I found out orange had to be three. Make them talk it out and that is going to set up your classroom for success, making them explain their reasoning. Start it from day one. Activity number two is a scavenger hunt. Again, this can be done in person or virtually. You can make a scavenger hunt over classroom materials. You can make a scavenger hunt over classroom expectations. Um, you could also even make it over their textbook. I know I've done that in the past. You know, virtually you could have them do a scavenger hunt for your Google Classroom page. Um, or again, for their textbook. So this can be done in person or virtually. You can do it with a Google form, um, however you like to set that up, and then just make the questions things that you want your students to be thinking about. Like I suggested with the textbook scavenger hunt, you know, have them find certain words, have them check their answers in the back, show them that they can use their textbook as a tool to help them. Activity number three is called Make a Million. This game can easily be done virtually or in person. I'll go ahead and put up kind of what the game board looks like up here. 
um, and pretty much it's going to be six boxes over six boxes and you are you as the teacher are going to roll the dice a total of 12 times each time you roll the dice the students have to place that number in one of those boxes all right once all the boxes are filled they're going to add those two numbers up and see who has the closest to a million right make a million that's why it's called that you could use a normal dice but that is only going to be one through six um, so I do suggest using a ten sided dice with ten being zero or look up an online spinner put um, zero through nine on it and do it that way so typically the way the game is played like I said they have to write them in as you go and they cannot move them another alternative would be to give them a time limit. You give them the 12 numbers that they have to place and then give them a time limit and see, okay, at five minutes, who can get closest to a million. Another way to adjust this for maybe younger students would be instead of make a million, make it make 1,000. And instead of, you know, six boxes over six boxes, make it three over three. So some hundreds plus some hundreds gets who can get the closest to a thousand. You could adjust it to 10,000, a hundred thousand. You could adjust it to a hundred. You could adjust it to 10. Well, that probably wouldn't work because you're gonna, everyone's gonna have the same thing if you have two dice and you add them up, right? But you get the point. You can easily adjust this for your skill level and for your classroom setup. The fourth activity is called Petals Around the Rose. So this is the virtual version of Petals Around the Rose. You could, of course, do this with real dice, um, but the virtual version is nice to have. You could just project it, um, and it shows those uh, five dice being rolled, and then you can guess, and it tells you if you are right or wrong, and if you are wrong, it tells you what it should be. Okay, your students are going to start to figure out what the trick is, at different times um, so you have to make sure that they promise to not share until you know everyone starts to figure out a hint to give if they are taking a while is to pay attention to the name of the game that should help them figure out what the rule is and then get it right every time students always love this activity and ask to do it again which doesn't really make sense because once you know the rule it's kind of a one-and-done activity but it really gets students thinking and thinking about rules. Why is this happening? Um, so if you're starting to introduce functions, this could be a great activity. Also, you have to make sure it's very clear that once a student notices the secret, they don't just blurt it out and they are sworn to secrecy and they cannot tell any other students. Activity number five is a game I call skunk. I got this from another teacher um, so I'm not sure if this is what it's usually called, what she made up, or if I remember it wrong and this is what it's even called. But how the game works is you are going to write skunk on the top of your paper. This is another one with dice that can easily be done in home or at person um, because all you really need is a dice yourself and then to, a way to communicate that to your students. So we're going to write skunk and each one of those letters is representing a round. So what you are going to do is you are going to have all your students stand up or have some symbol for in the game and then when they are ready to get out of the game they can sit down or um, whatever symbol you come up with for that. Then you are going to start rolling the dice. So let's say you roll the dice and it's a three. All of your students are going to write three under that first S because that's the first round. All right, then you can tell your students, do you want to stay or go? All right, so if they stay, if they stay standing, that means they're still in the game and they can write down the next number. If they choose to sit, they're out. They get three points for that round but they get those three points guaranteed. When you sit down, you guarantee those points. And the reason why you might wanna sit down is because every time I roll a one and you're standing, all of your points for that round are now gone and you have zero for the round. So this game is all about chance and luck and a little bit of probability. If you've rolled the dice five times and haven't got a one, chances are the sixth time you're gonna get it. Right, so you can kind of talk about how that affects and how 
you know, what our predicted probability is versus our actual probability. Students get super excited about this game. There's yelling, there's screaming, there's like people making deals with other people. Um, it's super fun. So like I said, you would do that round until you roll a one. Then anyone remaining gets zero for that. Everyone else can count up how much they got for that round when they sat down. Then you would go on to the next letter. So now you're under K. Same thing. You're going to roll the dice and students are going to choose to write it down and stay standing or write it down and sit down to keep the points they have written down. My sixth activity is again one that I got from another teacher and I'm not sure if I remembered the name correctly, um, but I'm pretty sure it was called Bump. And this again, you could do in person by getting in a circle, um, or you could do it virtually if you have a set order that you go in in Google Classroom, like with small groups and things like that. So this game is working on multiples. So what you're going to do is you as the teacher are going to choose a number. Um, typically numbers five through nine work best, right? Seven and eights are two multiples that a lot of students have a hard time memorizing. So I will use this game a lot of times um, for memorizing multiples of seven. So how the game works, each student is going to take a turn saying the numbers, just counting out loud. But whatever number you choose as a teacher, they are not allowed to say. So let's say we chose seven. When it gets to the student who's supposed to say seven, they cannot say seven. Instead, they say bump. All right, but with that, they also can't see any multiples of seven. That's where I said it works on our multiples. All right, so who, when it gets to 14, again, they can't say 14. If they do, they're out. We start back at one, but then they say bump, goes to the next person, 15, 16. And then there's one last rule. You also can't say any numbers with the number inside of it. So what I mean by that is if my number was seven, I can't say 17, I can't say 27, I can't say 37. When I get to the 70s, it's gonna be chaos. It's gonna be bump, 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 but make sure you keep track because then whoever is 80, if they say bump, they're out, start back at one. Okay, so as you can see, this game kind of weeds people out each round um, and then you see how high you can get up to. Like I said, five through nine work best when you use anything lower than five. Um, you do end up saying bump a lot, right? If you chose two, it'd be every other number. Um, so usually this is best for five through nine, but it's a great fun way to work on team building as well as our multiplication skills. My seventh activity is called Witzel. This one I actually found on Pinterest and have seen so many teachers using, and it looks so fun. This could easily be done in person or virtually. All you have to do is be able to project one of the Witzel cards so that the students can see it. You could even post it in a thread and do it that way. Okay, so these game cards are three by three um, with numbers in each spot. You are supposed to be able to make any number from negative 12 all the way to positive 36 using either rows, um, columns or diagonally and you can use any operation so you can choose you know I'm gonna add these two and then multiply or I'm going to divide these two and then add the middle one you know parentheses you can use those however you want to do it but you have to be creative right you have to use different rows different columns different orders of operations so there's a couple of ways you can play this game um, the typical way you play it is you put the Witzel card up and then you start calling out numbers. All right, who can find negative 10? All the students start going to work trying to make negative 10. Whichever student has it first says, Witzel, you go make sure the fact is in fact true. It does make negative 10. And then that student would get a point if you want to make it a game or however you want to do that. Another way you can play is by having them just find all of those. So you could give them a sheet that has numbers negative 12 to 36, and they go in trying to fill in as many as they can. You could give a time limit with this, like, okay, you guys have you know five minutes, 10 minutes to get as many as you can, and whoever has the most true statements at the end wins. 
you could do this individually or in groups. So Witzel is a game that you, or Witzel Pro, I guess, is a game that you can purchase. But if you look up Witzel cards free or something of that, there are a ton out there that if you want to just try it first and make sure you like it, um, that is the route I would go. My eighth activity is a game called Set. And there is actually a whole website for this that I'll take you through a little tutorial of. All right, so if you just search Set Game on Google, it'll be that first link there. And on here, you can find daily puzzles. And um, the idea is to pair together three things that you think are a set. Um, and I'm actually going to link a tutorial video on how to play this game um, because they go a lot more in depth than I'm going to be able to in this video. Number nine is the 100 numbers task. This one is most likely going to have to be in person because it is a group activity and it is on paper. I will go ahead and link this sheet in the description box below, but you will pass out this sheet to each group of four and then they will take turns circling the numbers and see who can either do it the fastest or give a time limit and see who completes the most. Um, so what I mean by that is you'll have your four people in a circle around this paper all right, student, they're going to count out loud together. Um, so they're first going to look for one. Everyone in the group can look for one. But only the first person can circle one. Okay, then everyone's looking for two. Second person has to be the one that circles two. Same thing, keep going. Okay, so everyone can look at any time, but only one person can circle. So this really works on teamwork and communication. It's really important to reflect after this and talk about you know, what were things that you noticed made it quicker or easier? You know, everyone helping out or just one person looking at a time. So maybe you don't emphasize that everyone can help um, and you just kind of see how groups work together and see how it goes and then notice the things that the students that Excel did versus the groups that struggled. And then number 10, my last one is one I made up. It's called Team Tallest Tower. Um, by no means is this something new. I'm sure lots of teachers have done this activity before. Um, but again, it is a team activity that's most likely in person only, unfortunately. And it does require materials, which I know with cleaning procedures and all of that, this one could be difficult for people for some time. But in this activity, um, you get each group the same amount of cups. Then what I do is I set a time limit of anywhere from like probably around 10 minutes is usually what I go for. And in that time, each group has a chance to check in three times. Okay, and what those check-ins are is me coming and measuring their tower. So they can stack these cups any way they want without, you know, leaning them against something or using any other materials. And they have to see who can build the tallest tower. Right? They're going to try lots of different strategies and then they kind of come, they all start looking around and they all notice what the best strategy is and all kind of start copying each other. But I give them the chance to clock in or whatever three times. So then that way, if they want to try other strategies, it's not just like, oh, we did it one time, now we're done. No, it's like, okay, we tried that way, but that group's doing something interesting. Let's try doing that combined with ours and see what happens. So again, it's another great team building, teamwork activity, showing students how things are better when you put your minds together. Um, so another great activity. Like I said before, these games could be used throughout the year. A lot of times I try to introduce a few of these in the first month of school. So then if we have five minutes left at the end of class, we're like, all right, who wants to play skunk? And everyone, me! So not just the first day or first week, but things that you can use throughout your school year this year, virtually or in person. I hope this video was helpful for you. If it was, please give it a thumbs up and share with a math teacher friend of yours. Also, if you want to see more videos from me, I would love it if you would subscribe. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.